I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey in a minute, but before we do that, I just want to run through a quick introduction. And for those of you who may not be familiar with what BuzzSumo is, just give you a quick intro to BuzzSumo. And don't worry, I'm only going to talk for two or three minutes. So let's go back. So if you're not familiar with BuzzSumo, we are your all-in-one PR and creative content solution. And BuzzSumo is backed by data. We have trillions of data points that we update constantly every day. And I'm pretty confident saying we have more data than any of our competitors. And when I talk about data, like there might be some data analysts on the call um, that get excited about that. But for most people, your, your eyes might roll a little bit. You say, no, what? Data is great. I'd love to use data more, but it, it feels like work. Um, it feels like something I have to add to my day. It feels like a job I have to do to analyze this data. And that's not the goal of BuzzSumo. We want to give you data-backed insights. But I, again, I think insights. We're not just going to dump data on you. We want to distill down that data and help you do your job better and quicker. So for example, if you're manually monitoring your space online, like most of you probably are going on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Reddit, and trying to keep stay on top of what's happening, you don't have to do that. You can use our trending tool. And, and you'll stay on top of everything that's happening. You'll react to breaking news quicker than your competition. And it's going to save you just a ton of time and help you move quicker. If you're manually building earned coverage reports, our monitoring tool is going to help you do that better because we're going to find all that coverage really quickly and faster because we're going to have a report ready for you in just a couple of clicks. So BuzzSumo, it's a really easy to use platform. And again, we're going to give you data-backed insights that help you do everything you do quicker and faster. You don't have to take our word for it. We're looking up to have some great feedback from people in the space. Some, some of the quotes here, people we partner with before. And my favorite ones are just the unsolicited Twitter feedback we've gotten on occasion, which makes us so happy when we see. So again, you don't have to take our word for it. You don't have to look at just our G2 reviews. We have some great feedback people in the space and industry. With that being said, let's jump into the why we're all here today. I'm lucky enough to be joined, or we're lucky enough to have Kelsey Library on the call today. And if you're not familiar with Kelsey, She's somebody who has a ton of experience in the space. Not only is she a co-founder at Fractal, which is an award-winning marketing and PR agency. She's been a featured speaker at MozCon and PubCon. She's even written for the Harvard Business Review, Entrepreneur, and Time Magazine. So really, really excited to have Kelsey here today. Thanks, and Evan. Why, thank you. Yeah, and why I'm excited too is you, you've run an astounding 5,000 campaigns and I think we've let that sink in. That's that's a lot of work. And, you know, we're just excited to hear you distill down, talk about your approach and how to earn press coverage. But that being said, I'll, I'll turn it over to you with just one quick note. We're going to leave some time at the end of the call for Q&A. So if you have any questions, just pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We're also going to make sure we send out a copy of this webinar. It'll come out later this week. So just keep an eye on your inbox and we'll make sure we send you a recording and a copy of the deck as well. So that being said, Kelsey, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you. So give me a second to sit, share my screen. I also want to say real quick, I use BuzzSumo on a daily basis. So I completely agree with all of the feedback that was shared here. It's an incredible tool. Uh, I use it for ideation. I use it for pitch targeting. Pretty much every feature they have is incredibly valuable to any of the work that we do here. Um, so. I will dive in. Evan did a great job with my intro so I can kind of just breeze through who is Fractal and who am I in this space. Um, so Fractal has been around for 10 years. Uh, we launched our business back in 2011, 2012. Um, what we do is we design marketing campaigns based on interesting research that we pitch to publishers to get high authority backlinks that drive organic rankings. That's kind of the elevator pitch of what we do. We have a lot of other services with on-site content, but today what I'm presenting is how do you get those high authority backlinks with the work that you do? So Evan went through some of this information. Um, we've done over 5,000 campaigns. We've been in business for 10 years. Budstream recognized us. It's the primary CRM we've used for many years as their top 5% most effective accounts for digital PR. Um, we're also established as a clutch industry leader um, for content marketing, and we're on the Moz recommended list. So, you know, there's been a huge surge in agencies that do this work. Um, Fractal is one of the leading authorities in this space. I also personally have conducted research over the years, surveying thousands of high authority writers at major publications to understand 
what does it take to break into your inbox? Um, how can I provide value to you? And how can my clients provide value to you? So a lot of that research has been distilled into fractals, best practices and processes. And that is what has allowed us to get some of the placements we do today with Wall Street Journal, New York Times, a lot of, you know, any major publisher you think of, Fractal has likely placed with them. So what I've done today is kind of distill that deck, um, the, that research into this presentation. Um, I also analyzed thousands of pieces of feedback from the work that we do. Uh, we have tracked it since we first launched our business. Anytime a PR person gets a response from a writer, especially valuable takeaways that we can kind of apply to our processes, we track that information. So for this deck today, what I did is I distilled some of the most actionable quotes that we've received over the years and how that's kind of informed our processes and how it can help you be better about both pitching and creating content for that high authority press. So why is high authority press important? Um, I've gathered a couple quotes here that kind of demonstrate the value in the work that we all do here. So one good link from a big news site can be more impactful than millions of low quality links. So when we first launched our business back in the day, our positioning was very much about viral marketing and how do you get a large volume of links from high authority sites quickly. Um, Google has more recently come out stating that it's not really a volume game like a lot of SEOs back in the day who used to buy links and link networks, uh, you know, that's penalized, right? Very heavily and has been for some time, but they've shift, shift, shifted the narrative more to, you know, that good authoritative links as trust signals and that it's not volume, it's more the relevancy and the authority of those sites linking to you. Another study from Eric Eng and Moz looked at how obtaining links from more authoritative sites has more value than obtaining a large volume of links. So this is research that they did over several years and analyzing millions of results where they concluded, again, the more authoritative sites are what's driving rankings. Uh, also, HubSpot has a really detailed article about the 200 known Google algorithm ranking factors. Um, and within that, they say sites with better quality sites linking to them tend to be higher in rankings. So kind of all these sources and all this research comes together to say, you know, it's all about earning high authority links to drive your rankings. So in addition to just the high authority links that you can earn with doing newsworthy research, uh, there's a lot of secondary KPIs to digital PR and content marketing, brand credibility, you know, reaching to your target market online, driving brand engagement with newsworthy research, and overall driving conversions because you're driving those rankings up for your conversion pages. So how do you produce link worthy research? Uh, the way I distill this really is focusing on tangential consumer-focused, newsworthy research that you produce on behalf of brands. I really lean in with our clients on going a little bit tangential because when you're too on brand with your research, it can basically be seen as sponsored content. And I've done research that demonstrates how a lot of these major publishers, yes, they have sponsored content arms. They're charging hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes for one or two campaigns. And Google isn't recognizing those links in the same way that they recognize earned links. So the more tangential you can get with your research, the more off-brand, you know, it can relate to your space, but not be so much of a, a brand marketing message, a conversion about a specific product launch. That's not what we're talking about today. Um, a great example of this is uh, cord cutting is kind of fractals. We did a research project looking at people mooching off of uh, other people's streaming services. So like Netflix and Hulu and other ones, and how much were people saving by doing that? Um, had a lot of other elements in it, but that type of research, you know, can relate to them because they're used as a provider for these different services. Um, and this kind of was tangentially to related to that. It got coverage on TechCrunch, MarketWatch, Pool, Fortune, CNBC, USA Today. So that's just like a very early preview of what that kind of means. So at Fractal, how we define a campaign is we produce somewhere between one to three assets generally. So these are data visualizations from the findings that we have kind of condensed into what is the newsworthy hook here? What is the most interesting takeaway we have from our research, whether it's a, a stat or a chart? And how do we get that across as quickly as possible with just a really clean graphic? Um, we've looked at our link reports in the past and have seen that oftentimes publishers aren't actually including these assets in their articles, but they are used in the client's landing pages, the client, you know, 
it adds value to the dwell time on their site and readers look at it. And it's just in general, an interesting asset to include. So the point here is that assets are great, but you don't necessarily even need a graphic to pitch your research. It's the research that's getting covered. Um, so traditionally why we built landing pages back in the day is we started out just pitching research alone. But what happens is oftentimes publishers will, you know, cover the research, they'll name the client, but they're not linking to the client then. And then they're like, okay, well, I sourced them. I provided, you know, credit to them as a source. Why do I need to link, right? And what you don't want to do is be seen as kind of like a spammy SEO agency. You want to be seen as a research partner. So what we did is we kind of distilled our research into a landing page so that we could convey, okay, well, you know, we would like you to source our client for this research here. There's also a lot more valuable information maybe than whatever few stats you chose to cover. Um, so if you could link back to credit us, that would be great. Um, that simple shift in our strategy was you know, foundational to how we were able to earn links from publishers. Um, it's now pretty much standard that whenever we pitch, we're including the landing page back to our research, we're highlighting the data, and we're getting those links in a very organic way. Um, so I would definitely strongly advise posting that content somewhere on your site to justify the link back. There's plenty of times publishers will just link to a homepage or somewhere else, um, but having that landing page asset is definitely helpful. So what we do are three different sets of research projects that earn links. The first one I shared is kind of the bread and butter of what Fractal does. We refer to that as more data journalism campaigns, really in-depth research. It generally takes us somewhere to be between four to six weeks to conduct that primary research, visualize it, write about it, get it up on a client site. It's a very large project. Other agencies might refer to that as a hero campaign. There's other campaigns that we also do called newsjacking. Some companies refer to this as reactive PR. This is much faster research that you do. It's very simple and it's based primarily on breaking news. So what breaking news is happening in your vertical that you can do quick research on or you can provide expert commentary on to earn coverage with stories that are just about to take off. So the real key here is that there's that exponential growth curve when there is a breaking news story, especially one with national appeal and consumer interest. And so what you wanna do is you catch it just as it starts to take off and you pitch your client as you know, the expert with the comments on the story and you know, how can people learn from whatever's happening or how can they have some sort of actionable advice. And we'll go into some details on this as we go through the deck. Um, really your goal here is rapid data acquisition. So client quotes are the quickest and easiest thing to do. Google Trends data is extremely helpful and you know, even just something like the percent interest in growth over a certain term can get major headlines like you see here. Listicles, social scrapes, two to three question surveys, predictions. There's a lot of different formats you can do to go for newsjacking type of campaigns that have zero or low cost and really focus on anything you can do within 24 hours. Because if you miss that window generally, then that curve has already happened and you're pitching you know, a week or two into the news cycle, you're not really adding value to what's already been kind of commented on. So here you see this example where we use Google Trends data for a client inner body research. Uh, it was at the time where Roe v. Wade leaked. Um, within days of that happening, 24, 48 hours, we had client quotes about, you know, okay, what does this mean for society? Um, you know, what is happening in the space? We were looking up trends for vasectomies at the time because what is related to, okay, Roe v. Wade overturning and birth control is in threat. What are the other options for people? And what was fascinating is that there was a 250% increase in the search phrase how much is a vasectomy and other vasectomy related terms. So we paired that data with client quotes on vasectomies and it blew up all over the news, right? MSNBC, Katie Couric, Today, Politico, iHeartRadio, hundreds of other sites linked to it simply based on Google Trends data and a client quote. So that's news jacking. Um, another approach you can take is resource link building. So resource link building isn't as much of a volume game. You're not gonna get a ton of like mainstream news coverage. Or coverage. But where your focus is, is kind of those high value .edu, .gov association links. Um, the way you can do this is by producing more in-depth resource content. So this is a much more on-brand approach, right? You're kind of figuring out what are the FAQs in my industry and how can I answer that with like a 10X content guide, you know, be the most thorough version of this on the web so that I am the most authoritative source. And then I'm going to pitch that 
to other government.edu high authority publisher pages where they're already curating a lot of resources. So you can see two examples of this here. The, the site lawsuit, we put together a guide for palimony law, Investopedia linked to it and many other sites. Another client, we did a guide to the best tech scholarships um, or a guide on student financial literacy. And we got a ton of .edu links to that. So this is part of building that really diverse link portfolio that helps rank your site as an authority because you're getting a lot of different authoritative sources linking back to you, telling Google you're a credible, trustworthy source and you should rank higher. So these are different content strategies that can allow you to be seen as that authority to pitch different types of publishers to earn those links. So these are guides, tools, stats pages, list goals, roundups. Really, it's not so much a research focus as it is gathering all the information that you have internally that is out there online and distilling it into the most helpful resource online. So, you know, is Fractal really the expert on what publishers want? Um, I have hundreds of these quotes that I could put here. My designer said, this is as many as I can fit. <laughs> um, so the message here is that you can see Bloomberg is requesting future studies from Fractal. Time is saying, this is fascinating. Please put me on your list. Uh, apartment therapy is, we're so excited to move forward with this. Um, there's a lot of really authoritative publishers out there that have seen Fractal. We've built our brand to be an authoritative research company that creates newsworthy findings that these publishers want to see more of. So that's really what your goal is when you wanna do content marketing and digital PR, especially for link building, but really just general press, right? And en brand engagement. So how we refined our strategy using a decade worth of this publisher feedback. <clears throat> so this is a quick pulse survey here that everybody can, you should see a little pop-up on your screen to weigh in on how important you think it is to personalize your pitch to top tier publishers. Okay, so we have the data near here now, right? So 85% of you said it is extremely important. 15% said somewhat important. So that's great, right? You're headed in the right direction. Um, personalization can mean a lot of different things to people. So I'm gonna drill into what personalization means to me, right? Because you can say I'm personalizing something because I'm covering it based on what they recently covered or I am talking about their beat, but personalization to me is something that's a bit different. So when we launched Fractal 10 years ago, it was on the cusp of kind of that exponential growth curve in content marketing, right? Um, there was less than 30,000 people searching for it. Today, there's 210,000 people searching for it. Um, I did a lot of research in our early days with the publishers saying that they got somewhere between 100 to 500 pitches a week, right? That's, that's incredible. Um, now, 10 years later, we have sources saying they're getting upwards of 1,000 pitches a week. So, I mean, imagine, imagine your inbox, right? I get a couple hundred emails a week and it's hard to maintain. I couldn't imagine being a publisher that's getting a thousand, you know, a top tier writer that's getting a thousand pitches. And how do you sift through that? And how do you as a digital PR person stand out in that? So the biggest thing I learned when I first started my career was this quote. I was at a PubCon Vegas conference, Robert Cialdini was speaking and he highlighted this research from Northwestern Law. It says, the degree to which we perceive another person to be similar to ourselves in traits and attitudes or to be worthy of our generosity or assistance depends on the extent to which we perceive a personal connection with that person, no matter how trivial. So that's huge, right? It's saying, if you take the time to slow down and actually have a personal connection with the writer on the other side of the inbox, they are, from a psychology, psychological standpoint, more driven to help you out or to connect to you, to at least respond to your pitch and help inform, you know, what you could have done better if they maybe are interested in covering that story. So paired with this is this quote from Unilad, which is a response we've gotten, where they're, score, they're literally scoring our pitch 10 out of 10. 90% of the emails I get from PRs are simply copy and pasted with high name at the top. So Yes, that's a tried and true PR strategy where people are blasting press releases, they're coming up with a pitch template and they're sending it out to thousands of people. That works sometimes, right? But it doesn't really work if what you're trying to do is build a very valuable network of high authority writers who see you as a valuable person to get research from. So I personally uh, do not support that quote spray and pay, pray PR strategy that has been around for decades, right? Um, what I'm a huge fan of is personalizing your pitch. 
I did this when I first started an agency out of college. My analytics were the best in the department. I believe strongly in this strategy and I've trained my entire agency on the same approach. So what does it mean to personalize a pitch, right? To me, you can see here the business insider person. Thank you so much for your email. They're actually thanking you for the outreach. The intro made me laugh a lot, right? Like if you can get somebody to laugh on the other side of your email, you're doing a great job. Um, the ways in which we do this are we're typically looking at Twitter or LinkedIn or Instagram or author bios. Writers are already out there trying to build up their own personal brand. So they're generally sharing a lot of personal information or just general interest pieces. So what you do is you kind of distill all that information and what do you personally connect with? Like I, I say, don't fake it. There's plenty of people that I've seen over time that will connect with something that I, you know, maybe wasn't true personally to them. I would strongly advocate you find something that you really do connect with because authenticity can be, you know, easily deciphered in a pitch, in my opinion, if you're trying to connect with some really random information. They're going to know, like, is that really true? So you can see here somebody laughing about hair trauma. The you know one of our PR people connected with them about a story or a tweet they made about hair tra trauma. Another person is laughing hysterically, ha ha ha! Over eighty songs are the best. Uh, another person comments on how somebody shared a dog photo. Right? There are so many approaches to how you can personalize your pitch. The point here is that you're slowing down and you're actually connecting with that writer. So they know that you're not a PR person that, that's just mass blasting everybody, spamming everything. You know, you don't really respect their time or their inbox. Uh, you're doing the exact opposite. You're building relationships with these people and standing out. One of the best ways to do this, in my opinion, is through the subject line. Um, and then also the first few sen sentences in your intro, because what better way to stand out from a thousand <laughs> emails in a week than to write something in your subject line that makes it clear you know that person. Not that you know that person, but that you, you know something about them and you've taken the time to do that research, right? So tons of examples of how to do this here. Um, personalization can be super simple, right? It can be one sentence long here. Like I sent a pitch in July. Um, I dabble in our news jacking from time to time um, where I talk about cheers from a fellow browser, browser tab hoarder. Given it's 10 a.m. and I already have 50 tabs open, it's going to be a day, right? Like so many people that work online have this problem. This writer put it in his Twitter bio that he has this problem. And he immediately responds to me. Literally, I sent this pitch at 1020. He responds by 1120. And he's saying, glad it's not just me holding on to my tabs tightly. So little things like that can generate the response. You can see here that I did not put a personalized subject line in my subject. So you can vary it up here. Uh, if you feel really confident in your subject that it's going to get the writer's attention because of just the research that you have is so unique and relevant to them, go with that. If you have something personal that you want to include and you think that's a stronger hook, go with that. You have to judge based on the writer you're pitching. Another way to personalize your pitch can simply just be about what the writer covered recently. So what you don't want to do is say, I read quote article title, and that was really interesting, right? Because we all have seen offshore people mass spamming uh, us really, we get pitches every week, which is kind of funny to me that look exactly like that. I read X, you should cover Y. Y really has nothing to do with my site. So what you wanna do is really comment on the piece that you read. Look for a story that they covered preferably within the last month. It doesn't necessarily need to relate to what you're pitching though bonus points if it can, cause there's a nice seamless transition that happens there. And you can see just by connecting with what that writer actually covered, the person re replies, best PR emails I've ever received. You did a great job on it. Like little things stand out to these writers. So what else can you do to add authority signals? <clears throat> One of the biggest pieces of feedback that we've gotten in all the years that we've done this is publishers asking for client quotes on the work we do. So much so that we've actually changed our internal documents so that we solicit those quotes from clients when we go to deliver that final draft. Um, another thing that we do is we have a template that we use when these publishers ask for client quotes. We quickly draft up a doc, you know, summarizing what they're looking for. We even provide the client quotes for our client to approve. And what we're trying to do here is move rapidly, right? Because we all know we generally want to be able to turn around uh, any type of questions that they have within 24 hours max. So the more legwork we can do for our clients, and also we have a lot of experience commenting on these things, the better off the 
you know, press will generally be. Um, we did it quickly. We have it really thorough. The client just signs off. About like 90% of our clients or more just go with what we say. Sometimes it's a very specific request and they actually, you know, have that expertise. So they'll comment. Um, really your goal here is to get actionable advice too, right? So one of the other pieces of feedback we get sometimes are, yes, you can do data research and that's really interesting, but how do you make it actionable, right? Like you need to take this research and help my readers understand what do I do with it or what, you know, what are the hooks here that like I can get out of this? So various examples here, we've done research, our clients either are highlighting what stands out to them in the research or they're providing actionable advice on top of it. Um, your client may not always be an expert on your research, right? Because your goal is to go a little bit tangential. So a great example of this is we, one of our clients is about kind of insurance bonds, right? Which is a very dry topic to most people, right? How are you going to break into mainstream news with that? Um, so what we've done is we go a sidestep and we did a study looking at, well, female truckers, right? Because there's a huge women's movement. Um, we, women are getting into trucking and that must be a difficult industry to break into because it's predominantly men. And, you know, how is that going? What feedback do they have on it? So we did a study on that. Naturally, CNBC Business Insider immediately responded and they're like, we want to talk to a trucker. And we're like, okay, well, our client is an insurance bonds. They don't have any female truckers they know. I reached out to there. I looked online. I'm like, okay, what other associations exist on this topic? There was literally a women in trucking association that was at the top of search. I looked up their PR person, shot them an email. Hey, I have an urgent opportunity for you to get Business Insider Press for free. Um, I just need you to connect me with the trucker because you, you're a whole association about female truckers. You must know someone, right? Um, they were all over it. They responded within minutes. They sent me seven different female truckers. They sent me their CEO to talk to. It was incredible. Um, the writer at both Business Insider and CNBC used them as a source. They did multiple interviews. The CNBC story just went live in the last week. The Business Insider one is scheduled to go live next week. So you don't always have to be the expert. You just need to find experts. Experts can exist in associations. They can exist on LinkedIn. Um, they can be researchers, educators, professors, any number of things that aren't necessarily a competitor to your client. So scaling your results. Um, yes, I am all about a personalized pitch, but sometimes move, the news is moving swiftly and you need to scale your outreach rapidly to get into those inboxes, right? So this is primarily used for news tracking. Um, so Google search is one of the best ways in addition to BuzzSumo and the trending news uh, to get at what is breaking that a lot of high authority publishers are covering. Apparently I'm really popular via text right now. Um, so what I do is I will do broad keyword searches, um, looking at kind of what is relevant to my research that I can talk to, and then what is kind of breaking in the news on this topic. So if I'm already doing a news tracking campaign, I know what to start with, um, but this can relate to any campaigns that you're doing. Um, so broad searches, I can see you know, what's happening in college on ChatGPT. We did a study earlier this year in January. New York City Public Schools was the first school in the country to ban ChatGPT, both for teachers and students. Um, we saw this news and we acted rapidly. You know, they're a leading education system in America. We knew that other schools would be looking to them to set an example. This was going to cascade across education policy, other states. We quickly ran a survey of both educators and students to see you know, how many people were using ChatGPT at that point. It had just gone, uh, just become accessible in December, end of December. And by the first or second week in January, it was already banned. So there are angles here on like colleges banning it, on public schools banning it, on workplaces banning it. Um, and we quickly ran some research to figure that out. Like what were the sentiments around that? So what your goal here is, is you're trying to segment all of your research and your findings into different groups of what could be a pitch template, right? So you're gonna go after all the people that are covering the college bans. You're gonna go after all of the people that are talking about K through 12 bans, because traditionally those are separate writers, right? People cover K through 12, people cover secondary school. Um, then you can go after the ones that are just covering general tech and like, you know, the fact that it's being banned in workplaces or elsewhere. So by grouping all those findings, what you're trying to do is distill it down to somewhere between, you know, five to eight, five to 10 of the most newsworthy takeaways based on each trending story, right? What is really surprising here? You don't want to regurgitate the news. You don't want to say something that's widely assumed. Um, 
the more you kind of focus on what's already widely known, the quicker a writer is going to immediately overlook your story because it's like, okay, you're already telling me what I know. What's, you know, I don't have time for that. Um, you're trying to focus on staff that have a really strong emotional response. We did early research that was featured in Harvard Business Review about the viral emotions that lead to sharing. Um, the surprise was one of the biggest emotions that led to sharing. So, you know, what is giving me a strong emotional response from this story? What is surprising here? Attach that to the trending news angles. You know, what can you juxtapose based on what's being covered? What can you expand upon based on the questions writers are asking? Oftentimes writers will literally ask questions in the stories that they're covering. Um, and how do you create all these bullets in one cohesive story when you go to pitch, right? You don't want to just share a bunch of random stats. Generally, you're trying to build each stat on one another so that they can see, okay, here's my story. So quick example, the chat GPT story I was mentioning covered in Wall Street Journal, uh, Business Insider, USA Today, Silicon Republic. It got over 200 pickups on high authority sites and other syndications that happen naturally. Um, each one of these stories takes a different angle, right? Because each one of these writers had covered a different angle. And that's why it's great for you to write pitches that have maybe different formats to focus on different types of writers because there's tons of writers in each of those categories. Um, this is the actual pitch that we sent. So what I've highlighted here in these boxes are the stats. So these stats change up based on which writer we're pitching, but generally they flow within this format. We also on occasion will provide client quotes or quotes that we've gathered through our surveys, right? So it's really great if you can have a question in your survey where you're asking, you know, the people who are taking it, what is your open-ended feedback here that we can provide value to? Um, highlighting that type of information led to all of this great coverage. Um, so you can kind of see here, the lead-in is talking about what is breaking in the news, right? Um, we connect the Google search interest growth that's been happening. 112,000% growth in interest in the last year. Like that's crazy, right? It makes sense because it just launched, but this is the position you're taking to make that newsworthy hook. And then how are we kind of commenting on that? You know, what is this utility in education, its implications? What is the broader consumer sentiment on how this is happening? And then we dive into here's all the new data that we have that you could cover. Here are the commentary on it and go. Another way to approach this is more of like a headline driven approach. So I don't believe that any one PR strategy should follow uh, one template to a T, right? There's a lot of different types of templates that can work. These are the templates that we've found to be most successful. So a longer one with a lot of stats, some client quotes. This is, uh, you know, I'd say this is a shorter one with, with stats. This one doesn't have as many stats. It's a different study. So this one is the Roe v. Wade one that I was talking about where we're really just pitching the Google Trends data and then the client quotes, right? So we don't have a lot of bulleted things to share. So instead, what we're sharing is headlines. What are the headlines we could see a writer cover? Um, daily searches for vasectomies up 99% since Roe v. Wade. Searching for how a vasectomy, how much is a vasectomy up 250%. 250% increase in searches act, asking if vasectomies are reversible. So like, what are the related terms that you can look at Google Trends and get those kind of hooks? You know, generally we're looking for anything that's over 100% growth to be a hook. And then kind of detailing in that, you know, here are client quotes that relate to each of these topics. This got covered on MSNBC, Politico, Today, Slate, Daily Mail, iHeartRadio, hundreds of other sites. Totally different style pitch, totally different methodology, same great coverage. One of the other things you can do is it's in my opinion, a lot easier to break into UK publishers sometimes than it is dot coms. And ultimately your goal is to get as many unique linking domains, authoritative unique linking domains as you can with any one of your stories. So sometimes you might hear a writer say, oh, well, you know, this isn't relevant to my audience because I'm based in the UK and this is US news or whatever. You know, your dem what are your demographics is a very common point of feedback. But if you can target writers at say Daily Mail, Independent, wherever that are specifically covering breaking news or trending news, literally as their beat that they cover, those people are actually covering global news. They're not just covering UK news and they exist on every one of these mainstream sites. So you can see here, Roe v. Wade was a US thing. It was affecting Americans, right? Not anybody else outside of America. Daily Mail covered it because it was you know, a broader political news writer. Okay, we have another poll survey coming up here. So do you prefer to pitch using an embargo, an exclusive, neither, or it depends? So <clears throat> a lot of companies, when they go to pitch, will use an embargo where they're saying, okay, I'm going to pitch 
dozens or hundreds of writers at one time. And within my pitch, I'm going to give them a deadline for when they can actually start to cover this. So nobody's allowed to cover it until April 1st, right? Um, an exclusive is more of a slow pitch approach, uh, pitching a few select writers at a time, offering them the first rights to cover it. So you're not pitching a mass, it's just a slower. You could do neither and pitch however you see fit, or maybe it depends on the, what content you have. Okay, so 43% said it depends, 13% said neither, 37% said an exclusive approach, and 7% said an embargo. So that's really interesting, right? That's a pretty diverse group of responses. And oftentimes, right, it does come down to what you're pitching. When I'm pitching this type of research that I'm speaking to, I'm 100% of the time using an exclusive. We've tested over the years with embargoes or whatnot, but what we've found is that the most effective thing to do is to use high touch outreach to the select publishers that you know are gonna have the biggest syndication networks and go for them first. Because if you can get it with a writer that's gonna to syndicate to a hundred other writers, either because they have, let's say they're a national news publication. So they have a built-in syndication network to all their other regional publishers or they're just a high authority publisher that's a vertical thought leader. So like PC Mag, right, is like a, a tech leader. Market Watch is a finance leader. Identifying those types of publishers will, and making sure that you give them that exclusive opportunity will allow you to do a lot of less legwork because they're going to syndicate it for you. They're going to have people looking at them. They're going to have their own syndication networks. It'll go wild from there. So generally, when you're providing an exclusive, um, when a writer expresses interest, you want to kind of follow up and ask for when they're going to publish it, because sometimes editorial calendars can be very full and it could take weeks. You don't want your data to become stale. Usually they're pretty open and understanding if they're like, hey, it's going to take me weeks. You can continue pitching. I'm still going to cover. Um, always evaluate the timelines you're willing to wait, right? Like if it's a, a great writer, they personally have great syndication, which you can see in BuzzSumo, you know, simply writing in their author name, you can see how much engagement are they getting, where, what links, what other people are linking back to their stories often, you know, is this a publisher or a writer who's worth waiting for? Um, and that kind of information will dictate how long you're willing to wait. Generally, we're not willing to wait more than one to two weeks because we understand the research that we have will become stale. So writer follow-ups are a huge thing. I'm going to move a little faster because I know it's 1040. We've got 20 minutes and you guys might have questions at the end. So Writer follow-ups happen almost on all of the emails, right? They've got questions that you need to answer rapidly. Um, one of the biggest types of questions we get is them asking, do you have information on X question, right? I'd say 60, 70% of the time, we usually do, right? We don't visualize all the thousand cells of data that we have on any project. We visualize what we think is the most interesting, but we might have further demographic details that they want. We always ask demographic questions and that's traditionally what they're looking for. The other opportunity here is if they want a very specific type of question, run a quick poll survey, right? If it's, if it is the best publisher and writer, and you know that you can get this answered within a few hours on any one of the survey platforms that you're using, run it real quick and get them that data. Um, it can mean the difference between building that relationship and getting that placement or not. Um, another thing you need to be ready to do is back up your claims, right? There are so many companies doing this work now. Um, and there's a lot of research out there. So your research can oftentimes be different than what other people are sharing. Uh, generally you, you see a trend and, you know, some, a lot of the data aligning and you're presenting the new data. So it gets that coverage. Um, but here you can see, you know, a writer from computer world saying, Hey, this study looks the exact opposite of what I'm seeing out there and what I'm writing a story on. And so we gathered data from all these other sources that mirrored our findings. And then the writer said, oh, I'd be happy to juxtapose this instead. So we just turned it from a decline because they were questioning our data to a story for our, cl our client because our data presented a different angle and, client and writers love to do that. Um, so what are the pain points of digital PR and content marketing? One of the biggest points of feedback I also saw was freelance writers or contributing writers, oftentimes their reply was, I need to get editor approval. I need to pitch this to my editor. All of these bullets are from freelance writers saying, I need editor approval. Sure, maybe a staff writer needs that approval too, but generally they have that understanding, they have that authority, they write their own stories, whereas freelance writers need that approval. Um, this was across tons of different sites. So what I generally do is I'll pitch staff writers or editors before I'll pitch a freelance writer if there is that opportunity. Um, 
Another thing you can do is track seasonal event calendars. There's a lot of different resources for this. Connective has a really great calendar that I've linked in this deck and you'll get this after the presentation where you can kind of filter by category, by date and see what are the upcoming events, right? Everybody knows about like it's donut month or it's re you know, national reading month or whatever it is, it's women's month. Um, there's a lot of different angles you can do your research around. Just make sure you do, you finish your research at least four to six weeks before that month or that event occurs because if you don't catch it until the tail end they've already vomited all of that information online they've covered every single angle and you're coming in at the tail end you're not providing enough value so you want to make sure you're doing it four to six weeks ahead of whatever that information is the event is um even with your own research sometimes it can be perceived as stale especially with fractal right we're doing a very high touch approach we move slowly through a select list of very targeted writers and publishers so what can happen is, you know, we say generally it can take one to three weeks for us to land that first exclusive, but then it's going to blow up from there. So it's worth the wait. But while we're pitching, right, suddenly it's been two or three weeks since our client landing page went live and writers, the first thing they see is that publish date and they're like, oh, this is stale. It's already out there. So one of the things you can do is kind of update that date on you know, a weekly basis. If you have backend access, great, do it you know, more regularly. Um, I generally don't like to date our assets, the graphic assets that we're using. Uh, you can include that in your methodology. It doesn't need to be slapped on every single asset that this was from February, 2023, because as soon as it turns March 1st, that looks stale, even though maybe you conducted that research at the end of February. Um, so generally don't put dates on your assets. Um, one of the things I love to do is put passwords on all the landing pages that we have, because that guarantees that it's perceived as, hey, this research has not been published anywhere yet. It is exclusive to you. Make it super simple. Make the password exclusive. You don't have to be fancy with it. Um, or if clients can't do that, I'll say, hey, can you no index this page? Because um, I need to be able to say to a writer, this is, doesn't exist elsewhere. Because if they see it's live, they're like, mm, I don't want it. It's not, you know, what is newsworthy or breaking about this? It's already been online for a while. Um, so with freelance writers, you can see here just took a couple quick screenshots of writers on Twitter. They generally write for a lot of different sites. So if you have a specific publisher in mind that you want your research covered on, you have to make sure you specify that in your pitch. Uh, follow-ups are a huge thing, right? Everybody knows how important a follow-up is. One out of six placements from Fractal come from a follow-up. Uh, this data is from the last few years. I'm sure it's probably even more than that now. Um, follow-ups are incredibly important. Don't be excessive in your follow-ups. I personally think one or two max is enough. Like if a writer isn't interested after that many, you don't want to spam them and then be labeled as a spammer. So one or two max, try to differentiate your subject line in the follow-up, change your different stats in the follow-up, but the first one didn't resonate with them. What are you highlighting that's different? Don't just be like, hey, you know, following up here with the same information, right? You've got to give them a new hook to grab, grab that attention. Um, Generally, we're waiting somewhere between two to three days to do these follow-ups, right? Like everybody's inbox is flooded. Maybe they're working on something. You don't want to be too aggressive with it. Uh, oftentimes, we'll see writers forwarding our pitches to other writers. Either their editorial calendar was full, or maybe they have a different beat writer that might be covering a story on this. Always ask who they referred um, or try to decipher that when they say it to you. Like, oh, I'm going to forward this to the lifestyle editor. Well, go find the lifestyle editor. Take that pitch where they're saying, I'm going to forward this to that person. For, you know, use the Ford, scrape the whole email, send it to that writer that you found their contact information, change your subject line out to hi name, you know, person A, person B recommended I reach out to you. So now they clearly see in their inbox, hey, this person recommended, you know, I connect with you, your peer, I have something valuable for you. And they can see the string of email below. Yes, of course, they already got that information, but now they have you connected directly with them. And if they have questions, they can quickly talk to you and you're kind of following up to get that response. Um, never take one person's opinion as representative of the entire publisher. I've seen so many instances of this over my career where somebody will say, oh, we don't take marketing research um, on behalf of brands. Like you have to talk to our sponsored content team or, oh, we don't take surveys. We don't take X, Y, and Z. Well, here you go. There's you know, a writer at the Wall Street Journal saying we don't use that data. Well, here's three stories, three different stories from the last six months that Fractal got on the Wall Street Journal as a marketing company. So don't feel deterred just from one person. Now, if it's like a managing editor or like someone big there, yeah, you might want to take some caution in sending another pitch elsewhere. But if it's, you know, a low level writer or somebody that's even a contributor, they're not the expert on this information. Um, 
be really wary of sites that seek pay, uh, payment for placement. So sometimes you can be pitching and you know, maybe you're at the tail end of syndication, you're trying to find those really niche publishers. They're not as authoritative, but hey, there's still, you know, a mix of unique linking domains that you can go after. And then they may come back to you and say, oh, well, I want um, payment. So what's really interesting to me is this is a research project I'm also working on right now. Brackel gets these pitches all the time. If you own an agency, there are so many offshore people that are, have built these link networks, right, that Google has penalized. And, but, you know, back in the day, people used to pay to get links. And so they're still going after the people that aren't aware that that's going to get your site penalized um, when you're paying for link networks. So one of the things you should always do is I'm more than happy, though it's very rare, I'll maybe like less than 5% of the time, probably less than 2% of the time do you pay for a placement, but say there's like a mommy blogger, right? And you've got a really relevant piece of content or something like maybe there's a payment for her writing or whatever it is. It's very, very rare to ever need to do that, especially because we're going after the highest authority sites. It is illegal, I'm sure, from their their terms to be able to receive payment for that. Um, so what you want to really look out for is I do a quick search in Ahrefs, SEMrush, any one of these tools. What you can really see here is that link network sites or sites that have a spammy backlink profile are getting penalized by Google and your association with them could penalize your site. So quickly looking at, okay, here's this exponential growth curve in the referring domains. They clearly did not organically go from zero referring domains to nearly 30,000 referring domains in the matter of a week or two, right? Like that is so clearly spam. And you can see this trend across a lot of these publishers that are kind of trying to get that payment. And then you see a correlated direct decline in that organic traffic. So those are the sites that you do not want to be associated with. So refining your subject lines. Um, really, what are the reasons that writers are declining a pitch? 80% of them are saying, if you're pitching me content that is irrelevant to my beat, like I'm going to trash you so fast, I'm going to label you as spam. Like, don't do it. Don't be boring. Don't be so self-promotional. Um, how can you stand out? 76% of writers open an email from someone they don't know based on the subject line alone. So you, you really need to stand out with that subject line. The best way to do it, in my opinion, is with a personalized subject line or use stats. So if you're doing any type of research, you have a lot of stats that can kind of stand out as like, this is my newsworthy hook, my new information. Um, they can be the most attention grabbing. Um, as you can see here, we surveyed publishers. What is the most attention grabbing? It's the stats, right? Um, so what have we learned about campaign strategy? The next section is I will breeze through because it's mostly campaign examples and you'll get this deck at the end and I want to leave a little time for questions. So really what your goal here is relatable research. What can you do for your client that is relatable to the average person? Because that is what news publishers want to cover. They want to cover stories that is, you know, their readership cares about, which is the average person. So we did a study on what are the most common workplace aggressions, um, the writer at CNBC was literally like, oh my gosh, this is an amazing resource. My peers use these phrases all the time and it's been really frustrating. Like, I want to cover this. Like, that's what the response is that you want. Like, this is a valuable resource because it's relatable to a lot of people. Um, figure out, like, how do I feature data but make it actionable? This is a big common, you know, feedback point from publishers is like, well, how is this actionable? Yeah, it's data. It's interesting. It's new. It's cool. But like, how can readers apply this? So, always look to what client quotes you can add or what takeaways you can add that kind of give them that hook for what do I, what do I take from this? Um, oftentimes, a lot of publishers can be skeptical of surveys, especially when you consider back to that growth curve in content marketing. There are so many agencies doing it. They're not all really reputable. They're probably getting sent surveys that are kind of questionable. You always want to make sure that you're weighting your surveys and that you can speak to that that you're getting a large enough sample size. We traditionally aim for at least a thousand respondents on any survey that we're doing. If you're going after a much more niche market, you can do sometimes anywhere between 100 to 300 because it's a smaller representative of the national whole. Um, I've linked here, Pew Research has a really great video that kind of explains the importance of this and you know the justification of how a national survey can be representative of all of America with just a thousand people. So how? Um, Okay, so make sure all of your landing pages have a methodology section. Um, what you're trying to do here is just break down what is the research that you did, because that's the number one questions publishers ask. How did you get at this data? Um, what was the time frame? Yes, you don't want it slapped all over your assets, but you should have it somewhere in your methodology or at least be ready to speak to it. 
Um, what is a demographic breakdown? Writers really care a lot about that because plenty of writers just want to cover a millennial angle or they just want to cover a boomer angle or they want to see how the, that data differs. Um, and any other supplementary sources that you use that add authority to the research that you have. I love, in any campaign engagement we do with clients, we always try to have at least one regional hook campaign. So where we have data down to a state level, or even better, a city level, anytime you do that, you can suddenly open up your network to hundreds of other publishers that are just regional publishers that generally have a domain authority of 70 or above, which is really great. That's kind of my threshold for what is a real authoritative site. Um, and there's radio stations, there's news publishers, there's ABC, CNBC, Fox, right? And they all have regional sites. So anytime you can have regional data in a campaign, you're gonna get even more than just national news. Um, even better if you can get both US data and UK data. So you're not trying to do this with every campaign, but at Fractal, most of our clients engage for six to 12 months, over six to 12 campaigns. So we kind of make sure that each one of these campaigns fall into these different buckets. Do I have a US and UK campaign? That'll get me the UK links. Do I have a regionally focused US campaign? That'll get me all the regional links. Do I have national ones on X, Y, and Z vertical topics so I can break into parents.com or I can break into business insider or I can break into PC mag. Always try to be focused on diversifying your campaign strategy so you're getting a lot of different types of relevant links. Um, so obviously surveys are one of the easiest things for agencies to do. They're abundant out there right now. They are effective, but they can be questioned more often than not. So what can you do beyond surveys? Um, so there are a lot of different types of visuals that you can do that are really effective beyond you know, gathering data from social scrapes, from government sources, uh, Twitter scrapes, Instagram scrapes, whatnot. This is one example of where we used uh, a map, a GIF of a map to show how data changed over time um, using government different types of data sources, National Center for Education Statistics. Another thing we do is morphing gifts. So, you know, how did something and, you know, an outfit or a person or a style change over time? Um, that can be really unique to publishers. Image sliders are really effective too, especially if you're working in anything in real estate. You know, what did something look like before and then after and how has that changed over time? Uh, Instagram scrapes are super easy. Uh, great for travel type clients, you know, where are the most Instagram things for X, Y, and Z hashtags, where are the most popular things for X, Y, and Z topics. Um, Twitter scrapes are great too. Um, you can get a lot of different types of data, but dependent on which social platform you're scraping, just make sure that any one of these has an API and you have a programmer who can gather that data. Um, parallax pages, these used to be a lot more popular in say like 10 years ago, but they're still certainly effective, especially for like those longer kind of stories that you need to get into a lot of different and emo emotionally compelling and maybe sensitive data. Um, comparison charts are super simple to do, kind of showing, you know, where is the cheapest place to go, where is the most expensive, how do hotels compare to Airbnbs, you can use this in any number of forms. Um, Real-time pages are really great too, because you're giving a publisher a quick look at like NBA playoffs, NFL, any topic that's trending on Twitter and kind of distilling what are the takeaways for this specific trending news in your landing page. Illustrations are really popular. A lot of people, when I show this campaign, they're like, oh my God, I've seen that. Um, this was a study on what different countries perceive as, you know, to be the most attractive woman. So they got, you know, an image and they all edited it into what they thought different graphic designers in different countries was most appealing physically. And you can see just here that we had uh, 18 different bodies. Just here, uh, there are a lot of differences between Italy versus the Netherlands versus Egypt. Like what is it attractive everywhere? This blew up. Um, germ swabs can be really popular. So we've germ swabbed hotels, elevators, shopping carts, water bottles. Um, we've done some of these uh, year over year. And how does that data differ? Um, depending on what you're scraping at different, swabbing at different places, uh, this does really well, especially post pandemic and during the pandemic. Um, calculators can be really effective. Um, this can be a really effective conversion tool as well as tangential type content. They can be super simple and newsworthy. Um, and so all of those things come together to get a lot of publisher coverage, to get really high authority links that drive organic search rankings. We have clients that renew year over year with Fractal and they see this type of growth because this work works. Um, so I know that was a lot of information. You will get this deck from Boosumo after we wrap up here um, and you can click through all the different links and whatnot. I think now we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Kelsey. That was that was awesome. 
Um, great to see you. There's a lot of activity in the chat as well. Um, do you mind letting me share my screen? Yeah. Cool. Let me do the, go ahead and do that. All right. Awesome. So if you have any questions, we're going to get through a couple. Um, please pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. While you're doing that, just want to let you know, we'll be sending out some information shortly about our next webinar, but uh, which will be with Craig Rodney. Uh, if you're not familiar with Craig, he's currently a marketing agency coach and just has a ton of experience in the space. He started a tech-focused public relations agency, which he grew into one of the largest PR and social media marketing agencies in Africa with some amazing clients like Google, Vodafone, Coke, Forge, name a few. So we want to hear from you guys, which topic of these two sounds the most interesting to you? I want to give you a choice. So we're going to put up a poll in a second. So again, while, while we're doing this, please put any questions you have in the Q&A box. We'll get to as many as we can, but let us know what you think about the next webinar as well. So again, if you have questions, um, please put them in the box below. We'll answer a couple. And like Kelsey said, because there's just so much awesome information in this webinar, we'll make sure we send you a copy of the webinar out in the next couple of days as well. So we do have some questions that came in. Um, let me just start looking for some of the earlier ones too. I don't want to just catch who wrote in most recently. Very, very tactical one, Kelsey. What products do you use to run your surveys? Uh, we use uh, a few different ones. Prolific, uh, SurveyMonkey are two of the most popular. They can vary in their cost. So you have to weigh kind of which audience you're trying to survey um, and determine like, do you need a really authoritative source here? So like Prolific can be really great at, I need to find professors uh, at colleges or I need to find cops or any type of really narrow type of audience. Cool. All right. So well, another question I think is interesting is, you know, anyone's going to, it's an agency is going to have difficult clients, right? It's kind of par for the course. Mm -hmm. The question here is how do you utilize these methods with clients that are difficult or just have expectations that won't let you allow you to run reactive campaigns and are potentially poor communicators? Do you, do you shift your strategy with those type of clients and how you, or do you just shift your communication method and set those expectations up front in that case? Yeah. That's a great question. And one of the most difficult parts of our jobs, right? So fortunately for Fractal, um, we have enough case studies and research and you can always point to other people's kind of case studies sometimes if you're newer and getting started and demonstrating what works. Um, what I've done over time is actually shift. We do an onboarding, like a kickoff questionnaire that we send to all of our clients to kind of gather information of, you know, how comfortable are you with going tangential? Can you score that on a one to five scale? But before we get into those questions, I have a whole paragraph outlining you know, in order to get these results, you need to go tangential. The more on brand we get, the more narrow of a publisher set we can pitch. So like you have to acknowledge that when you go to score that you are not comfortable with going tangential, that you just neutered your results, right? Like you're, I also have now embedded that as part of our SOW language to say like, you know, this is our tried and true practices. If you do a lot of subjective feedback or you remove a lot of stats, um, you are ultimately just hurting your results. Um, so the more upfront knowledge you can provide about that, generally you can see clients will defer to you as an expert that they hired, right? They hired you as the expert. So just assert your authority and your knowledge and they typically will come around to saying, oh yeah, okay, I see that. Um, so that's the best way to do it is provide that knowledge set up front. Um, and ultimately like certain verticals are more difficult to drive rankings in. So like having that kind of exposure to the client and demonstrating to them, like we do link gap analyses at any kickoff engagement, showing them, okay, here are all the competitors that you listed in our onboarding questionnaire. Here are all the incredible links that they have. If you want to get those links, you need to do these types of studies. Awesome. Uh, one more quick question. Um, try to still this one down a bit. You know, if you're trying to reach a very targeted audience and you go to broad publications, you, you might see success and you might see some links generated, but you may have that question of how did, did you reach that more targeted audience? Do you have any thoughts to do that? Or do you just like the question in this case was, do you think digital PR is still a solution in that regard? Or, or do you see more traditional PR methods being more effective in that type of case? 
So like they want to get on a very relevant site and maybe not the national news type of stuff. Yeah. So these strategies are equally as effective to break into very niche association sites. What's great is it's actually a lot easier to get those. So like I focus a lot on the national publishers because that's where we start our strategy. But once we get that national coverage, then we drill into, okay, what are the associations or the organizations in this space? And what are the really niche bloggers that maybe aren't as authoritative, but you know they have a really focused readership? Um, those sites don't get pitched nearly as often. They don't get a thousand pitches a week. So they also generally don't see a lot of industry research. So connecting with those can be even more effective. Most any site that exists online, generally they'll have an about us page or a team page, or you can look on LinkedIn. Um, and traditionally I see most emails follow like a first name period, last name at domain or a first initial last name at domain. Those are the two most common. Um, and so you just kind of can take that approach if you can't find their email or find, you know, message them on the social platforms they exist on, but, um, they can be really easy connect to connect with and really it's just about finding that contact information. Awesome. Yeah. And actually, that BuzzTimo has a new database that we're launching in beta today that will have some email contact information for journalists. Thanks. So go ahead and check that out if you haven't done so already. Uh, a question I, I saw pop up is we talked a lot about how to get in front of journalists for a campaign. So, you, you know, you kind of break that initial barrier. You make contact with a journalist, they get back to you. How do you look at building that relationship as, as time goes on? And, and do, do, you, do you try to cultivate ongoing relationships with journalists? Or do you, you see yourself shifting, you know, from topic to topic and, and don't really build those deeper relationships? Yeah, that was a really big frustration for me early in my career when I worked at another agency is, you know, I had a lot of different clients that I was working on. So it was very difficult for me to build meaningful relationships with any specific set of writers. So one of the things we do at Fractal is we have a pretty large team and we try to specialize people on specific clients within a specific group of verticals. So, you know, one girl has four different types of clients that exist within like college or education, and she can really build a lot of relationships with those writers, others specialize in tech and whatnot. Um, I have a Moz article that I wrote years ago on how to build relationships with writers on Twitter, which to me, I mean, that it's an evergreen resource. Um, what I love to do is basically whenever we sign a client, if you can create a list of all the leading writers within that specific vertical, so like education or tech, you can create Twitter lists, they can be private. And what your goal should be is at least once or twice a week, you want to pull up that list, see what they're tweeting about, retweet them, share quotes from stories that they're sharing, try to connect with them on something personal that they shared, just reply, 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 right? Because what your real goal is, is that if you can build relationships with them on Twitter, weeks or months before you ever pitch, now your email address and your name sticks out in their inbox versus if you're just cold pitching them and they've never seen or heard about you before, you're solely relying on your subject line to stand out. So I'm a huge fan of being active on Twitter and building those relationships. You know, as I've shifted my role in the agency to be more about the team leadership and not outreach as heavily, I haven't been as active on Twitter, but when I was doing this work much more aggressively, I was on Twitter every day tweeting at least probably five to 10 times. And it was super effective in getting noticed. And you can even pitch on Twitter too. Gotcha. So this is gonna be the last question. We're seeing so many great questions come in. Apologize to everybody. Um, we can't answer all of them as much as we wish we could. Mm -hmm. Question here is, do you shift your strategy for the B2B space versus the B2C space? Or do you just take a very similar approach? You can take a very similar approach. Um, ultimately, whether you're providing research to consumers or businesses, it's all what is newsworthy within your target market that you're going after. Um, there are plenty of B2B type publications, especially most mainstream publishers all have, they've got anywhere from like 10 to 15 categories, like head categories of topics they're covering. Most of them have, you know, business or tech or tra your traditional verticals in there that you can go and pitch those writers at those sites. Um, and the same for associations, right? Like associations love this research too. So, you know, if you want to get that credibility and reputation and brand awareness on, you know, any association that's relevant to your space, go pitch them. Awesome. Kelsey, th thank you so much. There, there is so much information jam packed in there. Um, so again, we're going to make sure we send out the recording of the call. Um, I, I learned a lot being honest, just from listening in there's, there's a great presentation. Um, we, we also completed the poll. So for the, our next call, we're going to be option two, the key to unlocking growth is where we're going to focus. Or make sure we send you all invites out to that call soon. And again, Kelsey, I just said it, but I'm going to say it again because it's such a great call. Thank you so much for joining us. Everyone listening in, 
Thank you for, for giving us part of your day. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Great talking to you, Evan.